Okay, good evening and welcome to the fourth session of the Jews for Judaism Counter Missionary Survival Seminar. And uh, in the previous weeks, we have been studying about the concept of the Messiah. We learned that it's critical, it's important, in order to know whether someone is the Messiah, is not the Messiah, any discussion on the topic, you have to know exactly what is the Messiah. You have to have a definition. You have to have criteria. You have to have a template. And so we have studied what the Bible has to say on the topic of the Messiah. We understand that the Messiah basically is a wise and righteous descendant of King David, and he will rule as the king of the Jewish people. When? When the world has been perfected. When there will be peace throughout the world, the Jewish people will be living in their homeland, with our temple rebuilt, and the entire world believes in God. That's what the Bible says about the Messiah. Again, the important thing that we have learned is that the Bible focuses on describing what the world will look like when the Messiah is here. Rather than trying to describe what the Messiah is going to look like. He'll be tall, he'll have red hair, he'll have, you know, it doesn't describe the Messiah so much, other than telling us he will be a descendant of David, he will be wise, he'll be righteous. But the focus of the Bible is telling us what the world will look like when the Messiah is here. So we've seen that that description of a changed world, a, a world that's a utopia, right? A, a beautiful world, a perfect world, that has not yet happened. The world is still a broken place. And so we know as Jews, the Messiah has not yet come. Last week we began discussing, so what do the Christians say? What do missionaries say? And last week we explained, we, we discussed the idea that uh, missionaries claim that Jesus did miracles, and those miracles prove that he is the Messiah. Now, we saw basically two problems with this argument. Problem number one, we don't really have any good proof that Jesus did any miracles. It comes down to you have to believe what the, the Christian Bible says. The Christian Bible says it happened, then it must have happened. And that's all that they have to prove these miracles. These stories don't take place anywhere else in the world. And we saw last week that the Christian Bible has many reasons why we would doubt the uh, truthfulness of the stories. So that's one question. How do we know that Jesus even did miracles? But the more important question was, who cares? Even if he did miracles, it would not prove anything. Because the Bible never tells us that we will know who the Messiah is based upon miracles that he will do. The performance of miracles is never given as a criteria for the Messiah. And the, the reason is very simple, because we see from the Bible that bad people can do miracles. The Bible tells us, for example, that false prophets are able to do miracles. So miracles in the Jewish Bible don't prove anything. But tonight we're going to discuss the second arrow in the quiver of the missionaries. You know, missionaries have basically two main arguments two main arguments they used to prove, to prove that Jesus was the Messiah. Number one, they say he did miracles. Number two, they say that the Bible, the Torah, has many prophecies about the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled. That's the second basic argument they make. They say that Jesus fulfilled many, many prophecies in the Bible, and they say there are so many of these prophecies, some missionaries say over 300, they say there are so many that 
it makes the case for Jesus very compelling. They say that it really proves their belief. So that's going to be tonight's discussion. What do we do with all of these prophecies, all of these passages in the Bible? I want to begin by sharing with you a story. Uh, a number of years ago, I was flying to New York, and I had to wait for about an hour, an hour and a half. I had to wait in the airport uh, for the flight, and there was a big lounge, uh, bigger than this room, very large lounge, maybe 200 people waiting for their flights. I'm sitting there minding my own business, I'm reading, and there's a woman sitting across the room, the very other end of the room, and she's staring at me. And I see she's staring for five minutes, she's staring for ten minutes, and I say to myself, uh-oh, <laughs> I know what's going to happen. So she comes over to me, she walks all the way over, she says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. She says, are you a rabbi? I said, yes. She got very excited. She said, can I ask you another question? I said, sure. She says to me, is Isaiah in your Bible? Isaiah is one of the prophets in the Jewish Bible. I said, of course, Isaiah, we call him Yeshayahu, Isaiah is in our Bible. She got very excited. So she says, can I ask you one more question? I say, sure. She says, opening up her Bible, she opens her Bible, she says, who is this talking about? Who is this passage in the Bible talking about? So I somehow sensed that as she was walking over to me, this is what she was going to be asking me. So I said to her, do you have about 45 minutes? Do you have about 45 minutes so we can discuss this passage in the Bible? So she was very happy. She said, of course, I'd be happy to sit down with you. So we sat there for 45 minutes going over this passage in the Bible. And I'll tell you one thing. I don't know what happened to this woman, but I suspect she's never going to go over to someone with a black hat and a beard ever again. I don't think that she's going to bother asking any more rabbis. Because uh, she came to realize that this passage in the Bible, that for her was proof for what she believed, it was not so simple. Two things about this story. Number one, why me? There were many, many people in this lounge. Why did she have to walk all the way over to talk to me? Why couldn't she talk to the person sitting next to her? Right? So what we see from this is that Christians are very interested in Jews. They're much more interested in Jews than anyone else in the world. One missionary told me they would rather convert one Jew than a thousand non-Jews. Okay, so that's one thing we learned from the story. The next thing is that when she came over to me, she did not show me a verse, a passage from the Christian Bible. She didn't show me anything from what they call the New Testament. She showed me a passage from the Jewish Bible, from our Bible, because you have to understand that this is the approach that missionaries take. They want to show us that what they believe is in our Bible. They're going to say, it's in your Bible. It's in your Bible. Now, because so many Jewish people don't know the Bible well, many, many Jewish people have never really studied the Bible, these proofs these proofs of the missionaries can sound very convincing. And many Jewish people are intimidated 
many Jewish people are, they get nervous when missionaries bombard them with many, many passages from the Jewish Bible. However, the wisest person that ever lived, Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon, who wrote Sefer Mishlei, the book of Proverbs, he said, the first person, the first one to present their case often seems correct until, he says, the other one comes to cross-examine him. He says something very smart. If you go to a courtroom and someone is on trial and the government presents all the evidence to prove this person is guilty, you could be sitting in the courtroom and say, he's obviously guilty. Look at all the evidence. King Solomon says, but wait one minute. You have to first hear from his lawyer, from the defense attorney, because the defense attorney may be able to show how all of this evidence is irrelevant. There is another side to the story which will show that the missionary argument is based upon their misreading and misunderstanding of the Jewish Bible. So we're going to see that what they are presenting to us is really misunderstanding the Jewish Bible. Now we've seen, just want to uh, review with you, we've seen that the Jewish idea, our idea of the Messiah, comes from many passages in the Bible, many passages, and they're all very clear. They're very clear. And we said, how do we know that these passages are clear? How do we know they're clear? The answer is because everyone agrees with us. All the Christians agree. Yes, you Jewish people are right. The passages that you think are about the Messiah, that's correct. For example, for example, in the 11th chapter, chapter 11 of Isaiah. So it speaks about a descendant of David who will be the king. And during his time, the whole world will come to believe in God and the whole world will be in peace. Beautiful chapter. We say it's talking about the Messiah and the Christians say, yes, we agree. It's talking about the Messiah. And we say, but that didn't happen yet. There's no peace in the world. Not everyone believes in God. And we learned Last week, what the Christians say, they said, sure, but when Jesus comes back, all of those things will happen, right? Their idea of the second coming. So we discussed last week why that is a rationalization, and really it makes no sense at all. But I want, again, you to, when we start this evening, remember that our vision, our understanding of the Messiah is based upon many passages, and each one is very clear. But when it comes to those passages that the missionaries use, we're going to see the opposite is true. Let me give you an example that we're not going to study tonight, but in two weeks, in two weeks, the whole evening will be about this topic. But just I want to mention tonight, that the most famous passage in the Bible, the most famous passage that missionaries use is from the book of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, which speaks about the suffering servant of Hashem, the servant of God 
who suffers, who is rejected. And for the missionaries, this is the biggest and most popular proof they have. However, listen carefully, is that passage in Isaiah really speaking about the Messiah? If it really was, everyone would agree. It would be clear. What's interesting is, most Jewish commentaries say that that passage is speaking about the Jewish people who have suffered and who have been rejected throughout our entire history. That's what we say, most Jewish commentaries. And you should know that many, many Christian commentaries, commentaries by Christians, agree with us. So I'm using this just to illustrate, just to show you that the Christian proofs are not clear. They're not clear. Because here, their most popular proof is one where the Jewish point of view disagrees. The Jewish people say, no, that chapter is not about the Messiah. It's about the Jewish people. By the way, why, might, why would we say that? We'll see in two weeks. Because when you read the whole book of Isaiah, you read the whole book, Isaiah says many, many, many times beforehand that the servant of God is the Jewish people. So that's why we think that this chapter that the missionaries get all excited about is about the Jewish people because it's about God's servant. And because it seems pretty clear that that chapter about God's suffering servant is about the Jewish people, again, many, many Christian scholars and commentaries say the same thing that we say. They say, yes, that chapter is about the Jewish people. The point is that once we have a lot of disagreement about what it means, it cannot prove anything. It can only prove something when everyone agrees. So again, a simple example. If uh, someone over here is on trial, they're on trial for murder, right? And there are five witnesses that say, we saw him do it, and five witnesses say, no, we saw someone else do it. It's not a, don't, you can't prove anything. You need to have all the witnesses agreeing, yes, we saw that person commit the crime. So problem number one is that here is an example where in the most famous, the most popular proof that missionaries bring, it's not clear. It's not clear. Secondly, we saw that the Jewish concept of the Messiah, we saw was consistent, meaning it wasn't based upon one passage. Our picture of the Messiah came from many passages in many books of the Bible. Here is a big problem. They're saying that this chapter in Isaiah, where the servant of God is rejected, that's talking about the Messiah. So we would ask, really, how many times does the Bible tell us the Messiah will be rejected and the Messiah will suffer? There is no other place that even the missionaries can point to. Meaning, this is the only, that passage in Isaiah is the only passage they have. So it's not clear, because so many people disagree about what it means, and it's not consistent because it's the only passage that says that. They don't have any corroboration. They don't have any other passages which confirm that it's talking about the Messiah. Third problem, just, just in, for an argument's sake, the third problem is, even if it was talking about the Messiah, does it prove that Jesus was the Messiah? Meaning, all it would be saying is, the Messiah will suffer. But how do we know it's talking about Jesus? 
Many people suffer. Many Jewish people have suffered. So here, even if we accept the Christian interpretation, it would not prove what they believe. <clears throat> what we will see, and this is very important, very, very important, is that on every subject, not just the subject of the Messiah, on every subject, the Bible tells a Jewish story and not a Christian story. For example, two more examples. Two more examples. Does the Bible tell us that God is one? Or does the Bible teach that God is a trinity, three? What is the message of the Bible? So we say, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And when you read the Bible, the Bible is constantly telling us that there's only one God, there is no other. The Bible never speaks about Trinity. It never even uses the word. So when we read the Bible, again, does the Bible tell us a Jewish story about God? That God is one? Or does the Bible tell us clearly and consistently a Christian story about God? That he is a trinity? Another question. What does the Bible teach us about the mitzvot, the commandments? Does the Bible teach us that the commandments that God gave have to be kept forever? Or did the Bible tell us the commandments have an expiry date. Like you go to the supermarket and it says that the milk is no good after May 20th. So what does the Bible say about the mitzvot, about the commandments? Does the Bible say we have to keep them forever? Or does the Bible say that when the Messiah comes, you won't have to keep the commandments anymore? So when we read the Bible, we see it tells a Jewish story. The Bible says, no, the commandments have to be kept forever. As a matter of fact, the Bible says, when the Messiah comes, not that people will not be keeping the commandments, on the contrary, the Bible says when the Messiah comes, all the Jewish people will be keeping the mitzvot. Now, because the Bible, because the Bible does not tell a Christian story, what happens is the Christians have seen, they see a mirage. They see a mirage. What is a mirage? Right? A mirage, someone is in the desert. They have no water. It's very hot. It's so hot their brain is beginning to fry. And they're walking in the desert and they haven't had anything to drink and they're thirsty, and it's hot, and they're getting a little bit dizzy, and they see, oh look, over there, over there, there's water! That's not water. That's their imagination. That's a mirage. So what happens is, we're going to see tonight, that when the Christians read our Bible, you know, Mark Twain, Mark Twain, uh, so Mark Twain said, to a person with a hammer, to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That's what Mark Twain said. A person that has a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We're going to see that when Christians read the Bible, everything looks like Jesus. Everything looks like Jesus. what they do is they will pick out an isolated verse from a chapter. They'll just pull out a verse from the middle of a chapter and they will string some of these verses together and make it seem as if the Bible supports what they believe. 
But because, this is very important, because they are not reading the Bible to see what the Bible teaches. They're not reading the Bible to see what the Bible teaches. They're simply looking at the Bible to find things that sound like Jesus, to be able to prove what they believe. They're using the Bible to prove what they believe. And because of this, they usually misunderstand the Bible. I'm going to share a very famous story. There was a man who was walking in the forest, and he sees something amazing. He sees a tree, and on the tree is a target. You know, you've seen the target on the tree for people to shoot arrows, right? There'll be three or four circles, right? Concentric circles. You see, he sees a tree, and on the tree is a target, and he sees right in the middle of the bullseye an arrow. Someone shot an arrow, and he got it right in the middle of the target. He said, that's amazing. How did anyone shoot so perfectly? But then he walks a little bit further. He sees another tree, and the same thing. There is a target, and another arrow right in the middle, right in the bullseye. And he sees 10 trees like this, 10 trees. There's a target and one arrow right in the middle of the bullseye. He can't believe how did anyone shoot so perfectly. So he sees a man with a bow and arrow. He sees a man carrying a bow and arrow. And he says, excuse me, did you shoot those arrows? And the man says, yes. He says, I have to shake your hand. Unbelievable, unbelievable. How did you shoot so perfectly? And the man says, it's not that hard. You see, what I do is I shoot my arrow into the tree, and then I draw the target around the arrow Okay? That's what I do. I shoot the arrow into the tree. I draw the target around the arrow. That's what missionaries have done with our Bible. They shoot the arrow, right? Because to them, that means we believe in Jesus. That's their arrow. Now that they know this, they begin with that. They go back to the Bible, and they find things that sound like Jesus, that doesn't prove anything. There, it's called circular reasoning. In circular reasoning, you begin with your conclusion and you work backwards. It's like first having the verdict and then having the trial. That's backwards. First, you're supposed to have the trial and then you have the verdict. So this is the mistake that missionaries make. And it leads them, it leads them to misunderstand the Bible. Another way of putting it, they don't go from our Bible to Jesus. They go from Jesus to the Bible. That's how it works. A few years ago, Someone came to my office. Uh, his wife had been converted to Christianity, and he came to speak to me. When he walked into the office, he was very surprised. He saw a picture. Now, it depends where you're sitting, but if you look at this picture from far away, it looks like a famous movie actress named Marilyn Monroe. If you're standing far away, if you're standing at the other end of the room, it looks like a woman, Marilyn Monroe. And he said to me, Rabbi, 
That's a very weird, strange thing for a rabbi to have hanging in his office, a woman movie star. So I said, go up and stand closer to it. Walk up closer. And he walked up closer, and he said, oh my God, that's Albert Einstein, the famous scientist. So what I wanted him to see is that there are times when you look at something from far away and you don't see it very clearly. But if you go closer to it, you see it more clearly. And let me tell you another story where this happened to me. Many years ago, I was in Israel and I met with a couple, a man and a woman. The man was Jewish, his wife had become a Christian. And we sat down to talk. And I said to her, I said to her, I bet, I, I believe that when you read the Bible, you see Jesus' face on every page. I said, I bet that when you read the Bible, you see Jesus' face on every page. And she got very excited. And she says, yes, how did you know? That's exactly what happened. So I said to her, you know, my wife is an artist. My wife is an artist, she paints. And my wife paints seascapes. Like they're paintings of the ocean and the shoreline and the waves and the sand. So she once took me to a museum to see paintings of the ocean, seascapes. And I stood across the room paintings were across the room, and I said, wow, it looks real. It looked so real that I said to myself, if I touch the painting, my hand will get wet. That's how real it looked. So I was curious. I walked up to the painting. I stood right in front of it. What did I see? Cracks, imperfections. They were basically splotches of oil. Someone put oil paint on this canvas. From a distance, from across the room, it looked, it's called the illusion of distance. From far away, it looked like, like it was real. But when I got close to it, I realized this is not a, an ocean, this is just oil on a canvas. So I said to this woman, that's the problem when you see Jesus in the Bible. I said, it's because you are looking at the Bible from very far away. But I said to her, if you get close to the Bible, you look at it carefully, I said, you won't see Jesus anymore. She got very upset, very upset. She said, what are you talking about? So I said, let's do an experiment. I said to her, Open your Bible to the prophet Zechariah, chapter 13, verse 6. And I asked her, tell me who it's talking about. Now, she read that passage, and the passage says... They're going to ask this person, they're going to ask this person, what are those wounds in your hands? What are those holes, those wounds in your hands? So I asked her, who is it talking about? She said to me, you know who it's talking about. So I said, I don't know, tell me. She said to me, it's talking about Jesus. So I asked her, are you sure? She said, I'm positive. I said, how sure are you? She said, I would stake my life on it. That's how sure I am. So I said to her, you read chapter 13, verse 6. I said, go back now and read the chapter from the beginning. Read from verse 1. So she started reading from verse 1. 
and I was watching her face, and as she was reading, her face turned white, like a ghost. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, this cannot be talking about Jesus. She said, it can't be Jesus. I said, why not? She said, it's talking about false prophets. This chapter is talking about false prophets that will be stabbed. I said to her, but wait a minute. About 30 seconds ago, you said you would stake your life on the fact that it was talking about Jesus. What happened? What happened? So the answer is, because initially, she was reading the Bible from far away. Meaning, she never really paid attention to the context. She never really cared about what is this chapter really talking about. All she was interested in doing was going to the Bible and finding a, a verse that sounds like Jesus. So for her, she believes in Jesus. This verse talks about someone having holes in their hands. To her, this proves that Jesus must be the Messiah. Now, again, even if you, even if you misunderstand the verse, it proves nothing about Jesus. You know, there were 100,000 Jews that the Romans crucified. 100,000 Jews had wounds in their hands. But again, this is not careful study of the Bible. For her, and for many Christians, as long as it sounds like Jesus, it becomes a proof for Jesus. And I tried to show her what you were doing was ignoring the context of the passage. The passage there is not speaking about the Messiah, it's speaking about false prophets. <laughs> give you one more example. In the Christian Bible, so it says that when Jesus was a baby, he was in great danger, so he had to run away. He was living in Bethlehem, and he ran away to Egypt. He ran away to Egypt. And the Christian Bible says this was a fulfillment of a prophecy in the Jewish Bible. Remember I said before that missionaries say there may be more than 300 prophecies? Well, this is an example of one of them. So they say, you see, in the Jewish Bible, in the book of Hosea, the prophet Hosea, the New Testament says that the prophet Hosea said in the 11th chapter, out of Israel, I called my son. Out of Egypt. Out of Egypt. Out of Egypt, I called my son. Sorry. So again, just to review, the, the Christian Bible says that when Jesus was a baby, because he was in danger, he had to run away to Egypt. And the Christian Bible finds a verse in the Jewish Bible, and they say, you see what it says in that verse? It says, out of Egypt I called my son. And they say, that's talking about Jesus going down to Egypt. The problem is very simple. If you read the entire verse in the Jewish Bible, the entire verse says, when Israel was a child, I loved him. God is speaking. When Israel, when the Jewish people were a child, meaning when the Jewish people just became a people, they were just born as a people, I loved him, I loved the Jewish people, and the verse goes on to say, and out of Egypt I called my son. So God is speaking about the Jewish people there. But the New Testament, the Christian Bible, takes an eraser, and they erase the first part of the verse, which makes it clear it's talking about the Jewish people. 
and they only quote the last half of the verse, which says, out of Egypt I called my son, and that becomes a prophecy about Jesus. Now, the Talmud, our rabbis, taught the Gemara, the Talmud, taught 2,000 years ago whenever a heretic or a missionary, whenever a missionary or a heretic quotes the Bible, the answer is nearby. The answer is right nearby. And what the rabbis are saying is, because these people always quote the Bible out of context, meaning they are taking a verse from a passage, a chapter, that's not talking about what they think it's talking about, but because they've pulled one verse out, they can fool people. So all you need to do, the Talmud says, is read the whole chapter. For example, what I had this woman do for the verse in Zechariah 13. Right? All she was reading was one verse, and it was able to confuse her. When she read the whole chapter, she saw it was not talking about the Messiah. It was speaking about false prophets. We're going to mention one more problem tonight. Sometimes what the missionaries do in order to prove what they believe, again, to prove what they believe, is they mistranslate our Bible. They mistranslate it. So a very famous example. In the book of Tehillim, in Psalms, chapter 22, there's a verse which says, David is speaking. He says, I was surrounded by wild animals. And David says, like a lion, like a lion, they are at my hands and feet. The same way, for example, a lion may claw and attack a person's hands and feet. So the verse in Tehillim, in Psalms, says, like a lion, like a lion, at my hands and my feet. The missionaries mistranslate this, and they say it means they pierced, they pierced. So the way they read the verse is they say, they pierced my hands and my feet. They pierced my hands and feet. Again, for them, it becomes a proof for Jesus. Now, remember, we showed before, it still wouldn't prove Jesus, right? Because, again, there were over 100,000 Jews that were crucified. It wouldn't even prove Jesus if it was translated properly. But they have mistranslated it, right? The Bible never speaks about having hands and feet pierced. Now here's a good question. How do we know that our translation is correct and their translation is incorrect? How would you know? The missionaries will say, we've got it wrong. And we would say to the missionaries, no, you have it wrong. So how do you decide? How do you know who's right and who's wrong? So the answer is very simple. The word here in this verse is the word ka-a-ri. Ka-a-ri. An ariye in Hebrew, an ariye is a lion. Ari is another word in Hebrew. Ari is a lion. So ke Ari, ka ari means like a lion, like a lion. Missionaries say no, it means they pierced. 
So how do we know who's right and who's wrong? The answer is very simple. You find where else in the Bible does that word appear? That word must appear other places in the Bible. It appears quite a few times in the Bible. Every single time it appears, even the Christians translate it as like a lion. For example, in Isaiah, chapter 38, verse 13, the word ka'ari appears, and all the Christian translations have it as like a lion. And every single time it appears in the Bible, there are other places, it is translated not just by Jews, but by the Christians as well, as like a lion. So to summarize, to summarize, what we learned tonight is that Christians put a lot of energy, they make a lot of investments in trying to prove that Jesus was the Messiah because they claim that the Jewish Bible speaks about Jesus. What we saw tonight was that these proofs that the missionaries quote are based upon a misreading, a misunderstanding of the Jewish Bible. They take verses out of context. They use circular reasoning, and sometimes they mistranslate the verses. Okay, that's a basic presentation on understanding how Christians misread the Bible to prove their beliefs to Jews. Next week, we will have a discussion on probably the most important theological, is that a, a, the most important theological issue, dividing Jews from Christians, will be next week. So if there are any questions, I'm very happy. We have a question right away. Um, it would seem to me as if the whole point of Christianity would be that they take anything Jewish related and they and they try to convert us by like by like taking anything Jewish ever they did and then proving that it belongs to them. Like for example, Jesus, he was he was he was originally a Jew. And so really Christianity is all about that they take Jewish origin and they and they're like they form it entirely. What's a good English word for that? Convert? Well, to, a good English word for what you just described. Take what belongs to us and use it to try to convert us. What is, what's a good English word for that? How about this? Hijacking. Hi, hijacking. That hijacking, thing. right? They're hijacking our property, our Bible, our traditions. When a missionary wears a kippah, when a missionary wears tzitzit, when a missionary calls themselves rabbi, when a missionary wears a black hat, right? When a missionary uh, calls their church a synagogue, right? They are hijacking our religion and using it against us. That's, you're exactly right. Uh, so why do Christians, well, well, more so, all of the Nazis, I would like, specifically Christians, especially, why, why do they feel that they have to hijack us? So your question is, why do they feel they have to hijack us? And we discussed this uh, in the first, in the second class, right? That you have to remember that we threaten them. We threaten them. Because uh, the Jewish people, the fact that we exist, that we exist, 
it testifies that what they believe is false. Right? They would like everyone in the world to believe what they believe. But we are the experts, right? We are the people that really knew what the Messiah was supposed to be. And we said, excuse me, Jesus is not the Messiah. That really bothers them. It, it threatens them. It irritates them. So they feel they have a really serious reason to convert us specifically. No one else threatens them. They, they have to convert us simply because we don't believe in the same thing that... Well, so we discussed that there are many reasons why they try to convert us. Right? For most of them, they really believe they're saving us. This is what they believe. They believe that without converting, we are going to die and go to hell. That's what they believe. Now, we think they're wrong, but I try to show you that there are other reasons other reasons in addition to that. And one of them is the psychological compulsion to try to, again, as I said, many times when you are trying to convince someone, you're really trying to convince yourself. And Jewish people make Christians wonder. We make them wonder, you know what, maybe the Jews are right. And that's a terrifying thought for them. Maybe the Jews are right. Terrifying. And so in order to get over that problem, they try very hard to convert us. Other people in the world don't threaten the Christians. For example, there are in India today about a billion Hindus. About a billion Hindus. They don't threaten the Christians. So the Christians don't try as hard to convert them. But to convert us, they have, again, I mentioned over 1,000 organizations just to convert the 13 or 14 million Jews in the world. They are obsessed. They are obsessed. We say in Hebrew, Meshuga, right? They are Meshuga to convert us. I'll give you an example. I just someone sent me this week an article about major missionary efforts to convert the Jewish descendants living in Kaifang, China. How many Jews do they live in Kaifang, China? Not too many. Not too many. And yet you have many missionaries that are going there to track down these Jews and to convert them. Why? What, why, what is the what is the emergency? So again, they have, when it comes to us, they have what I would call a morbid obsession. They are fanatics. They are fanatics when it comes to converting the Jewish people. Because again, we threaten them. We make them very, very nervous. They're like brainwashed, uh, almost. I wouldn't use the word brainwashed. This is what they believe, right? When people believe something, right, they, why do they believe it? Because that's how they were raised, most of them, right? Most of them were raised that way. And they take it very seriously. They're very, they, they are devout. They're sincere. But because they believe this very strongly, and they know that the Jewish people are, we are the people of the book. We are the chosen people. We are the only people in the world who had a concept of the Messiah before their ancestors came to believe in it. So they know that what the Jewish people believe, and they know, by the way, Jews are very smart. So they know that what we believe has some weight. What we believe has some serious weight. And so the fact that Jews don't believe in Christianity, it makes them nervous. It threatens them. Because, again, the message that, it may not be something they think about consciously, but the message is, oh, maybe the Jews are right and we're wrong. And that's terrifying. It's upsetting. So how do you get rid of that irritation? So either you convert to Judaism, <laughs> right? Or you have to convert the Jews. And so they put all their energy 
into converting the Jews. Uh, so it seems like I said what most Jews would tell us is that um, Christians, is, well, well, really going, but like, but like especially Christians and the missionaries, they're just jealous of the Jewish people for this reason. It's an interesting word to use, jealous, because ironically, the missionaries think that they're going to make us jealous. The Christian Bible says that they will make the Jews jealous. But you know, there's a famous expression. When you point your finger at someone, right, you have three pointing back at yourself. Right? So when they say that we're going to make the Jews jealous, what's really going on is they're jealous of us. It's true. They're really jealous. But again, it's not something that's conscious. It's not something that's conscious. This is something I would say which is in the subconscious. It's something which they're not even aware of. It's something which sort of irritates them in a way that they may not really be able to explain it. They just know that something bothers them about the fact that the Jews don't believe. It bothers them, and I'm saying, I'm interpreting it, that it bothers them in a way which makes them nervous because deep down inside they suspect that we are right and they are wrong. But in the reality, it's actually the opposite. Mitch, are, are, you, are you signing his questions? Yeah. They think it's the opposite. Again, they think that we are wrong and they're right. Right? That consciously, that's what they think. But I'm saying that subconsciously, they are worried and nervous that we're right and they're wrong. So what do you do about that? There's two possibilities. Either you convert to Judaism, or you try to convert the Jews. Okay, now that uh, we know that really uh, Christianity is pretty much taking anything that Jewish ever did and like pretty much making it into their religion and like um, saying same thing Jewish ever did which are pretty much wrong. Is the Christian Bible um, is it really ours also? No. The the Christian Bible is not part of our Bible, in the same way that the, the Islamic scriptures, called the Qur'an, is not our Bible, in the same way that the Mormon scriptures, the Book of Mormon, is not our Bible. There are many holy books in the world. Many religions have their holy books. These are not part of the Jewish Bible. Right? Our Bible was completed. Right? Our Bible was completed already hundreds of years before Christianity came to exist, right? Um, and when the Christian books were written, they were never included in our Bible. Um, except for that, between the Christian Bible and ours, uh, there are some similarities uh, between them. Well, because the, what, what, the Christian, what the Christian Bible did was to base itself upon the Jewish Bible, meaning the Christian Bible took the Jewish Bible and then it glued itself onto the back of the Jewish Bible. So the, the Christian Bible is the Jewish Bible plus their books that they added. And what they did by doing this, it was very clever, it gives their book a lot of credibility. I'll give you an example. An example. There was a missionary who wrote a book trying to prove that the Christian Bible is divine, that the Christian Bible was given by God. How did the Christian missionary prove that the Christian Bible was given by God? By showing prophecies that were fulfilled. All of the prophecies that he quoted were from the Jewish Bible. Right? However, because he glues, not he, because Christians take their Bible and they glue it onto the back of the Jewish Bible, it becomes one book. So if you prove the, the Bible from the Jewish part of it, that proves the whole thing as far as they're concerned. Did you have a question? An explanation. Not a question. I, I heard a story from a man who became Jewish. He, 
before he was a missionary, a missionary became Jewish. And someone asked him, why did you become Jewish? The explanation was that in Christianity, the people, they question. Suppose someone asks a question about Christianity, and there are a lot of questions. They never stop asking questions. But Judaism, in Jewish culture, any question usually has one question. And there's a truth that comes out of it. And the truth is deep. But there's not many, many questions. Person, any Jewish person who has a question about a commandment, and he asks a rabbi a question on halacha, different questions. So he has a question. So suppose the question is deep. And the, the rabbi doesn't know. He doesn't know the answer. But for the Christian, they invent what's not right. And therefore, it's better to be Jewish and not create an invent answers. I'd be very interested in meeting that person. He sounds like a very interesting person. Does this person live in Canada? No, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, that's a story. Interesting. Okay. Oh, uh, yes. one, one last thing. Um, I'm happy to have an uncle uh, who grew up like modern Orthodox type of um, and he's now not from, he lives in the Yerushalayim with a bunch of these uh, amounts. He's a professor in anthropology. I don't really to know what uh, that is. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and he's very involved with Christians, so much to the point where he wrote a book titled How Christians Mini Israel. How Christians what? How Christians made me Israeli. What's the name? Uh, Jackie Belton. Okay. Um, in addition, uh, we have somebody in the family uh, who, who is originally Jewish and he's now a Mormon or he was uh, a, a, a Jew who, who married a Mormon. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what. What what's your take on those two? On those two people? Yeah. Uh, it's really impossible to say without having a lot more information. Um, I would really need to speak to you or someone in the family, you know, and get much more information. I mean, it it, it happens that Jewish people. Um, leave Judaism in many different ways. Sometimes just by stopping to practice Judaism. Sometimes by marrying someone who's not Jewish. Sometimes by converting to another religion. So, um, you know, you just describe two of those scenarios and, you know, all I can say is it's sad. It's a tragedy. Um, but more specifically, you know, about these cases, I would need to have much more information. Rabbi Skovac, would you encourage him to uh, have that person contact us? Um, I would need to discuss this, this is the case further. Yeah. Okay. okay, everyone should have a wonderful Shabbat. And we'll see you next week. <laughs> Thank you for your questions. <laughs>